The Seattle Seahawks lose a heartbreaker at home in overtime against the Los Angeles Rams. They moved to four and five on the year, two and four at home. They are now last place in the NFC West. Tomorrow is the NFL trade deadline. And the question now becomes, do they trade some other guys? And with the rumors swirling, do they end up trading DK Metcalf? Let's get into the discussion with Will Orner to talk about the trade deadline tomorrow and where the Seahawks are going to go from here, because this year it's not the playoffs. But before we do, the sponsor of this podcast, as always, is Black Label Supplements. Make sure to check out blacklabelsupplements.com. I'll put the link in the description of this video. Use code COUCHGM for 15% off your order. And as always, if you or somebody you know is thinking of buying, selling, or refinancing a property in the Pacific Northwest, make sure to reach out to myself, Connor Webb, Couch GM, as I'm a full-time mortgage broker during the day. It's my job to help assist my clients in figuring out the best financing option for their needs. I'll have my contact information in the description of this video if you'd like to reach out and connect. And with that, let's get into the episode. Seattle Seahawks lose another one in Seattle against the Rams, 26 to 20 in overtime. Brutal loss involving a, a pick six by the Rams late, getting stopped fourth and one in, in overtime. Mm -hmm. It ends, you know, Demarcus Robinson with the one-handed grab to secure the win for the Rams. The Seahawks moved to four and five on the year, two and four at home, and they are now last place in the NFC West. It is time to fire sell anything that you can before the NFL trade deadline tomorrow at five o'clock. Tomorrow's going to be an insane day. U.S. election, the NFL trade deadline, college football playoff committee's first official rankings of the season. And then we talked briefly off air. We also got Maction tomorrow. So Maction. Can't lot wait. Going, a lot going on. What are your thoughts on this game? I mean, who should the Seahawks try to trade if they if they should? Um, I saw real quick, I saw John Frisella, who's an NFL insider before the game yesterday. He stated that if the Seahawks lose today, yesterday, that they will be shopping DK Metcalf prior to Tuesday's NFL trade deadline. And then he also added that this could be the Super Bowl piece for Jim Harbaugh, Justin Herbert, and the Chargers. What, what are your thoughts? I hope not. I hope that they're not shopping DK. Uh, what is DK going to return you that uh, really puts you in a good spot? Like, are you really getting a first round pick for DK? I don't really think so. And even if you do, do you really want a first round pick from a team that you're giving a wide receiver where it's like, no, they might win the Super Bowl. <laughs> like, I don't want that 32nd pick in the NFL draft. That does me no good. And DK is still young enough that you can build around. Like if you told me, oh, hey, maybe it's Tyler Lockett or Noah Fant, that can be a conversation to be had because I like the way that Barner's playing. But you're going to get rid of, you know, the guy that's basically becoming the guy right when he becomes the guy. Like, that doesn't make any sense to me. Like, yeah, JSN has been really good, but you have the biggest freak in the position in DK Metcalf. Why would you get rid of him? That doesn't make sense to me. And I and there's an argument like, well, he's not on the timeline. Well, that's a, that's your fault. Like, what I'll never understand is this, like, world that Seattle Seahawks fans live in at times where it's like, well, Geno Smith's the guy. Geno Smith can get Seattle a title. The problem is the O-line. The O-line can't do anything. But we need to get rid of DK so that we can bring in someone for the O-line to fix it. And it's like you're either like a piece or two away from the window or you're not. You need to blow it up completely. And if you're blow it up completely mode, then sure, DK can go. But then so does Geno Smith because Geno Smith isn't really on that time frame. He's 33, 34. He's old. That's old. I'm sorry. I don't mean to be mean to you millennials. 34 is old in football age. That's old. So if you are in complete blow it up mode, DK bye-bye, well then sure. Okay. Let's have a conversation about that. Then you need to fire sale Geno Smith. You might need to fire sale Kenneth Walker because of what you could possibly get out of him. You might need to fire sale Reek Woolen. You might need to fire sale Julian Love. These are all people that if you're claiming, hey, we need to fire sale, we need to be done, then they should go. And you should get young talent, just like what John Schneider did with Pete Carroll when he first got in in that, you know, early 2010s. Get rid of everyone and get the young players in and let them figure it out together and show that you know how to scout. If that's not what you want and you say, well, we're one piece away and we can win a title with Geno Smith, then don't get rid of DK. It's not worth it. Don't get rid of him. I don't know what piece you do trade, right? Like what piece would you go and trade that immediately is able to return a bolstered offensive line? It's just not there. Your guard play has been bad all year. Both, both guards, you've had a bunch of rotations in there. It hasn't been good. 
your center right now, he's had back-to-back games where he's had bad snaps. And to be fair to him, though, one of them wasn't his fault. Gino needs to catch that football. So when I look at this team, it feels like you're a couple pieces away, but they're all in the same spot, and that's the offensive line. So I would not fire sale, but you're probably not a playoff team this year, and that sucks. And I think just kind of the way that it's gone down at the end, I think that's why there's so many people like fire sale, years over, years done. But I, unless you're making a move or you're saying, hey, we're going to go with Sam Howell the rest of the way, which it doesn't sound like that's what Mike McDonald wants to do. I, I don't see him. I don't see a move here. I don't see a move here to me. That makes sense. Why would you get rid of one of, if not the biggest freaks in the position that he plays in that still technically fits on your timeline, whether you're in a win now mode or whether if you go, Hey, we're going to give it two years. We're going to move on from Gino and go somewhere else. And to be fair to Gino, look, I'm not the biggest Gino Smith lover. Uh, I think there are some issues that he has in his games, specifically mistakes that he makes. He's a he's turnover prone, man. Whether these are his fault or not, Geno Smith is leading the NFL in interceptions. Am I wrong? He's thrown a lot of interceptions this year. It feels like there's at least one a game. Now, are they all his fault? No. JSN has to come down with that first interception or the one that becomes the first interception. They hit you in the hands, man. You got to come down with that. The next one, the excuse. Well, he got hit as he tried to throw it, so it hit his arm. He was trying to fit that ball into a tight window. If you're going to try and tell me that he wasn't throwing to JSN in the back, I just think you're wrong. He was trying to fit that ball into a tight window in the back instead of throwing it to Kenneth Walker. So there's a conversation there to be had about, hey, that's a bad interception on Gino. I get that his arm was hit, so it didn't come in. as Whatever. He tried to fit a ball into a window that it shouldn't have been fit into. And then the third interception, yes, Barner does get hit because the offensive line got knocked back. Eat that ball. That ball's got to go into the ground, in my eyes. If your eyes are on Barner, you should be able to see that he has gotten knocked back or at least slowed down. Put that ball into the ground, you know? And if you're going to say, hey, well, he can't see that, well, then I guess you're just going to blame everything on the offensive line because I do feel like that's where a lot of blame is going from a lot of Geno Smith backers. Now, don't get me wrong. The line's bad. He gave up seven sacks, seven for 46. And right now I, I got to go find the stat, but uh, so this is coming to you from underdog. So this is from Hayden Wicks of underdog. He is, you know, a football analyst over there for them. Geno Smith has faced an NFL high 93 pressures that were charted as a originally blocked and B still became a pressure on the QB within 2.5 seconds. That means that Seattle is identifying who to block and they aren't holding up and it's happening all game. That's a direct quote from his tweet, right? And he's fair, man. The O-line looks bad. Aside from Charles Cross and even Charles Cross doesn't look exceptional like you kind of hoped he was going to be. Your interior three look bad. At right tackle, you're piecemealing everything together because Abraham Lucas isn't able to play. So there is some blame there. For sure, the offensive line has been giving up a lot of pressures, and that's making life a thousand times harder on Geno Smith. But at the same time, to completely absolve Geno Smith of blame is just negligent. You're doing it because it's your quarterback. He has his own issues right now. Are they all his fault? 100% no. Is more of the issue on the offensive line? 100% yes. But there is still blame to go for Geno, trying to fit balls into windows that he should not be trying to do. Yeah, Geno Smith is tied for first in the league with 10 interceptions now after three on Sunday. He is currently fourth in the NFL in sacks with 28 on the year. As you kind of described with, you know, selling off, DK Metcalf has one more year in a contract. He is under contract through the 2025 season. Same thing with Geno Smith. If you decide not to cut him, uh, we kind of had talked about that briefly about how much money they they could save and spend elsewhere if they want to move on from Geno heading into next year. And then the rest of the the big names of the offensive and defensive sides of the ball, they're still under contract for at least one more year. A lot of them, two, three years, some of them. Mm -hmm. And then it's like, who do you extend? You know, like when you mentioned trading Kenneth Walker, I'm like, please no. Like, let's let's sign that guy up. Let's lock lock him up. Like Tariq Woolen, 
uh, obviously Devin Witherspoon, Witherspoon is under contract for a while. So, but it's like, yeah, what's the next core of this team look like? Lock those guys up, extend them. You know, DK, obviously he's a freak in what he's doing, but where's the potential value there? And do, is it a sell high, even though he is injured, so it's not quite a sell high? But, you know, what can you get for him compared to deciding to roll with him? And then do you extend him beyond next year? I still think you're going to get a lot from DK on the market. Like right now, teams need wide receivers. He's in his prime. You'd get a lot. I don't know if you're going to get enough of a return to me to get rid of him. Because then you're basically saying, well, Lockett's going to be gone in a year or two. He's really old. I just made fun of Geno Smith for being old. Tyler Lockett is old in a position where you don't you don't typically get old, right? So to me, why would you get rid of DK? You're now thrusting your third, fourth year wide receiver, depending on when Tyler Lockett decides to hang it up, to be your number one guy. Do you really want to do that? And Jake Bobo's great, man. That's a great fourth receiver. Do you want him to be your third? Do you want him to be your second? Because that's kind of what you're looking at, unless you go and make other moves. The other one that you got to throw in there, Sheldon Williams then has to get traded. It doesn't make sense to have him. If you're going to completely blow this up, you need to completely blow this up. I think the problem right now for Seattle, and it's been this way for the last four years, five years, you are a good enough team to where you're always going to be in the hunt. You're not a good enough team to truly win a Super Bowl. You are not bad enough to truly get blown out. Now, Mike McDonald has proven with his defense when he has everything clicking, they can be freaking awesome. They had multiple three and outs against the Sean McVay defense. That's why you brought him in. They stonewalled LA. And they're not the reason that they lost this football game. In fact, they're the reason they were in this football game. The offense looked terrific. But at the same time, you can look in the final two minutes of each half and go, that's what the offense can be when they are clicking on all cylinders. You can see what Ryan Grubb has going on. Look at the Atlanta game. The offense looked amazing the entire game. So you see these momentary flashes of what this team could be or what this franchise could be under, you know, this DC and this OC, but it's just not consistent. And then you also have little mistakes, stupid mistakes. This game, I didn't really feel like, you know, the penalties popped up in big key moments, but then again, JSN had what 80 yards taken away because of stupid holding penalties that weren't needed because you had guys that got burned. You have to build up that offensive line. You just flat out have to. But the problem is right now, I don't know how you do it. You've gone out and tried to get older guys for the guard position. Hasn't worked. Gone out and got younger guys for the guard position. Hasn't worked. You felt like you found two young guys for the tackle position. Lucas has been injured the whole time. And it's his knee, man. Like that's worrisome. You don't really come back. Like if you have two years where you're like, yeah, that guy didn't really play because of his knee. You don't then talk about his hall of fame career that he had afterwards. You know, I'm not here like writing Abraham Lucas off. The guy was awesome. His rookie year when he played, but you, with a big guy like that, you have to be worried about that. Right now, your best option is George fan at right tackle or the Finley kid. You know, like you have to find a way to build up that offensive line. When you won the title, you had the deepest offensive line in football, and it was anchored by Max Unger at center. It just was. You had the best center in football. And I don't know how you go out and make that move to where you get the best center in football. Do you go and draft it? Do you trust this front office to go and draft it? Look, John Schneider's a great GM, and he's gone out and he's hit on a lot of positions. Name me one O-lineman he's hit on. Like, truly, truly one O-lineman that he's hit on. Charles Cross. I don't remember if he was a part of the crew that got Okung. I wish you knew the names of more (laughs) O-linemen. Like when they were at their, I mean, shoot, half of it when they were at their best was because they had Tom Cable as the O-line coach and he was just taking defensive linemen and turning them into O-linemen. And he was actually being successful with it. I just, when I look at this team, I know for sure that Schneider got Cross. I don't remember for a fact if he got Okung or not. I can't remember if that was his first draft where he gets Okung and Earl Thomas in the first round. If he did, those are the best two O-linemen that he's gotten in a 13, 14-year period. So as good as this scouting staff has been at finding defensive backs, because they've been great, 
as good as they've been at finding talented wide receivers, as good as they've been at finding talented running backs. I mean, shoot, they did pick Geno Smith off a scrap heap and turn him into a very good starting NFL quarterback. They can't ID O-linemen or they can't develop them. Like that's just a fact right now. And until you're able to do that, this is going to be your team. I don't think Geno Smith is the guy, but I think that Geno Smith is a good enough quarterback in the right system with the right amount of guys around him that you can be a playoff team year in and year out. But you're just not right now because they don't have the O-line around him. And it's not fair. And the Geno sycophants, they're going to come out and say, this is all the offensive line's fault, which is wrong. It's not all the offensive line's fault, but I bet you it's 75%. They could run it back realistically with the same roster, you know, draft a quarterback at some point this year, have him work under Gino next year. You got Gino for one more year. You got DK for one more year. You got, you got Tyler Lockett still there. I will say that if, if, if uh, DK is traded by tomorrow, JSN looked like a number one wide receiver, seven receptions, 180 yards, two touchdowns along a 46. He looks legit. He's been really picking it up, getting great. a lot more targets in, in the, in the past few weeks. So we'll see if, if they do decide to move someone, if they do decide to move DK, but their season is not getting any easier. They're going to be heading to San Francisco on the 17th. They have a bye this week. They will then face the Cardinals at home at the jets at the Cardinals versus the Packers versus the Vikings at the bears at the Rams. And that's your season. I mean, it, from here on out, it's going to be tough. Yeah. You're look, you're, you're not a playoff team. You just aren't. And that sucks. So something has to change. I just don't know what can change at this trade deadline that immediately makes you a playoff team. To be honest, I think that trading away DK, even if you trade away DK, are you going to get two O linemen that magically change that offensive line? Like, are you really going to be able to do that? So for me, don't make a rash decision. Don't make a rash move. Hold on to DK and then figure it out in the off season. You still have him under contract and, Maybe I'm, maybe, you know, I'm out here making fun of the Geno Smith lovers. Maybe I'm a DK lover. Maybe I am. That's fine. I love blizzards. What he's been able to do in the growth that he's shown, I'm not going to knock it. I want that type of player on my team. I want the type of player who year in and year out gets better. He's going to be a thousand yard receiver this year. You know, if he comes back within the next two or three weeks after the bye, and continues to play the way that he is. It, it just feels very similar to the Blazers with Damian Lillard. And maybe that's because it's, you know, kind of the same owner. Maybe it's because those are my teams. And so I pay more attention to them and they're different areas where I could say, Hey, this team is like this and that team's like that. But it's, it's the Blazers under Dame. You are good enough to where you're going to be in the conversation. That Blazers team comparative to what the Seahawks are to the rest of the NFC was a little bit better. They were going to make the playoffs every year. But did you ever think Portland was really going to win a title? Even the year that they went to the Western Conference Finals, did you look at that Portland team and you were like, NBA Finals, here they come? No, you didn't. They were a good team. Depending on, you know, how they everything broke out in the playoffs, they might have a deeper year. They might not have as deep of a year. But they were never a serious contender. And right now, you're not. And that's unfortunate. Now you have to look at the positive things. Your defense went down and absolutely shut down Sean McVay's offense, which is why you brought McDonald in. That's fantastic. Offensively, you got a ton of yards. You did not finish because of key mistakes in the red zone again. Some of Pick them six. are on the offensive line. Some of them are not. Some of them are on the quarterback position. I didn't hate the going for it on fourth down. I hated the play call because your offensive line had gotten their ass whipped all game. And I cuss in that moment, not because I want to cuss and I'm not trying to get this video demonetized, but <laughs> it's just the truth. And it needs that emphasis. You got your butt whooped. You did. And you were, it, you were losing all game. Kenneth Walker had 83 yards, but his long was 10. You gave up 46 yards in sacks. And that's not counting all the penalties that you lost in holding penalties. I mean, shoot, you cost JSN a 200-yard game, almost a 250-yard game. So why why was the call to run behind the O-line on – look, it was fourth and one. That was like fourth and one and a half. That was a deep one. So I 
I don't hate any of it. I think the people that are coming out here and trying to absolve Geno Smith of all blame, they're idiots and they're wrong. I also think that the people that are, you know, coming out and saying that it's all on Geno, they're idiots and they're wrong too. It's mostly on the offensive line, 75%, maybe 80%. Geno still has to find a way to be smarter with the football. There aren't many quarterbacks who would do better than Geno Smith behind this offensive line. But if you can get a better offensive line, which you're not going to this year, if you can do that in the off season, do you think Geno's your guy? Cause I don't. Rams rallied from a 13 to three deficit in this game. And the Seahawks have now lost four straight at home. Five of the last six. We'll see how the rest of this year turns out. It's going to be a learning season for a lot of these guys just to get some experience under their belt, head into next year with some more experience. Hopefully they can, you know, take that next step, draft properly to fill out some of those holes that they do have and take a next step with some of those guys that are under contract for one more year. So mm-hmm. big, make sure to stay tuned in, locked in tomorrow during the deadline. If there's any breaking news with the Seahawks, one of us will be jumping on to update you. So make sure to stay locked in. Thanks for tuning in. Make sure to like and subscribe. Go follow Will Orner on Twitter at Will Orner, and we'll see you next time.